total cyclist takeover of Aeronaut tonight. Okay, great. Well, um, my name is Ken Carlson. I'm chair of the Somerville Bicycle Committee. Welcome here to Aeronaut. Welcome to Somerville. Um, and uh, welcome to uh, this panel discussion on how to keep um, bicyclists safe on what we would consider unsafe roads, and we'll go into that. Um, so um, the idea for this panel grew out of the cyclist community response to the death of Amanda Phillips. So for those of you who may not know, Amanda uh, lost her life a week and a half ago uh, in Inman Square. She was doored on Cambridge Street and then was immediately run over by a landscaping truck. Uh, this was incredibly tragic. Uh, it hit very close to home to a lot of us, um, not only because it happened in Inman Square, someplace that we all bike through, but um, it also was adoring. And we don't usually associate doring with death. Um, but doring is dangerous. Doring obviously can be very, very uh, dangerous in, in traffic situations like you have in Inman Square. So the, the community is still reeling from this. Um, uh, Amanda was the second fatality of a bicyclist in the Boston region. Uh, Richard told me it's the third fatality in the state. Um, so Eugene Thornburg lost his life in Lincoln, uh, also in June. Uh, the details of that accident are, or crash are, are not known yet. And then, thank you, sir. I'd have 100 people down my throat if I said the A word. Um, and then Allison Warmuth was the motor scooter rider um, who, was, uh, who was hooked um, by a, a, a duck boat. And if she was a cyclist, the same thing could have happened to her. So that could have been us. So these accidents, crashes, incidents could all be us. So um, that's why these things hit so close to home. So um, after this, um, the cycling community really galvanized after uh, Amanda Phillips' uh, tragic uh, death. And we immediately, um, from all walks of the advocacy world and cycling world, started what we usually do is advocate for change in the infrastructure. It's the infrastructure that's going to keep us safe. So this tonight is not about infrastructure. There has a, been a huge response in the community. We flooded Cambridge City Council with many, many advocates and normal everyday bicyclists. Uh, Cambridge is responding. Cambridge has been very responsive. And they are going to make and fast track changes to Inman Square, including protected bike lanes on Hampshire and um, on Cambridge Street. So change on the ground will come. It won't come quickly enough. And it won't come quickly enough across the Boston region to underserved areas um, across the city. But so the other thing we can do is try to educate motorists. Um, and obviously, the Doring situation is huge. I broke out an old shirt of mine. Um, and uh, so Cambridge is having um, a Doring camp, anti Doring campaign. Um, with their variable message boards. You've probably seen them around. Somerville puts in information and parking permit um, reapplications in the mail. Um, and uh, I think we all need to do our best with, with trying to educate motorists, but that's another panel discussion for another day. T tonight is about trying to have a, a sharing of what we think are the, the, the best ways for us to keep ourselves safe when we're biking on roads that are obviously not well designed or, or even at all designed for cyclists. So we have, um, uh, Becca is going to introduce this fantastic panel that have, uh, people have volunteered to, to be here. But um, I just want to um, say thank you to my fellow organizers. So Becca Wolfson, Executive Director of the Boston Cyclist Union. Um, Richard, Richard Fries, Executive Director of Mass Bike. And Stacy Thompson, uh, Deputy Director of Livable Streets Alliance. <laughs> There's a lot of cooperation happening here among all advocacy groups, and you're seeing it tonight, and you're continuing to see it. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, our panelists uh, who are here who will be introducing themselves in, in a few minutes. And I want to thank Aeronaut. Aeronaut has been a fantastic partner um, for, for, for the Bike Talk social series that we put on and for being uh, a really great sponsor for a lot of things related to the bicycling. Um, and I also want to just say, stay after the panel. We're going to be here for, uh, for about an hour and a half. There's going to be music by uh, Jan Marie, who's organized a fantastic lineup of bike musicians. So stay here uh, after nine and, and dance and talk and, and share. And uh, thank you for the audience for coming out. We're really uh, 
really happy that you guys are here, and uh, this is an important evening. And one more thing is that we want to take this panel discussion. This is the first one. We're going to take it across the Boston region. We're going to go to all the different neighborhoods in Boston and bring this education theme across the city. So this is the first one. We're going to see how it goes, and we're going to do it again and again and again and keep spreading this message. So uh, without further ado, I'll just introduce uh, Becca or hand it over to Becca. Thanks, Ken. Uh, again, you know, I also want to thank all of you for being here, but also want to give a huge thanks to Ken Carlson. Like he said, <laughs> like he said, we're all just trying to figure out the best way to keep ourselves safe, to move forward from this, and Ken really felt compelled to put this together for everyone in this community. So uh, I want to, again, thank the panelists. Thank you all for being here. Um, so I also want to talk about, uh, you know, why we're doing this, what this is and what this isn't. Um, we're going to be talking about some of the hazards that you can and do uh, encounter on your bicycle trips through the region and learn from each other how to stay as safe as possible given the conditions that we're dealing with. Um, we're not going to be talking about infrastructure and how it's failing us, how it's inadequate, even though we all know that it is. Um, and that's why so many of us in this room are also advocates. Um, we're also not going to be focusing uh, that much on equipment. Um, we'll talk some about it, uh, but everyone has different types of bikes. Everyone has different types of gear, things that uh, you, know, you can't afford, you've purchased. Uh, but really, this is about a total awareness of everything that you're encountering um, and again, uh, to give you the best defensive tools uh, as possible. Uh, we wish that we could be out there educating all the drivers on the road uh, how to you know, get along, how to be more aware of us. But again, in that absence, it's what do you do to look out for number one? Um, so in the next uh, hour and a half, we're going to do about uh, an hour of question and answer. Um, and then we'll have about a half an hour for <laughs> questions from you. So we ask you to hold on to anything that you uh, do want to ask, make a note, write it down, and we'll get to you. Um, so the, the topics, the questions that we're going to be asking of the panelists fall mainly into four categories. Uh, we're going to be talking about different types of crashes and how to avoid them, uh, defensive biking techniques, communication, uh, and understanding your infrastructure. Uh, some things will resonate with you, some won't, um, but there are going to be a lot of ideas brought to the table. With no further ado, I uh, want you to meet these panelists. We're going to start with Phil. Great. Okay. Hello. Um, thanks, Becca um, and Ken uh, for inviting me here. I'm stuck on the wire here. Excuse me. Um, my name is Phil Goff. I live in Arlington. I've been around for 12 years. Well, I was born 48 years ago, but I've been around here for 12 years, and um, I guess I raised my hand when I, uh, I've been biking for 40 years. Um, started when I was a little kid, and bicycling literally has been my whole life. I was really into BMX when I was a kid, and um, have been, in essence, a bike commuter since uh, getting out of college, I guess. And now I'm a professional bike planner, complete streets planner. Uh, and designer. I work for a company called Alta Planning and Design. We have a Cambridge office. Um, I do uh, roadway and streetscape design and planning, trail planning uh, throughout New England. Um, one of the things that, oh, and from an advocacy point of view, I was one of the founding board members of Livable Streets Alliance back 10 years ago now. It's amazing. It's been that long. And um, also started East Arlington Livable Streets as well about seven or eight years ago. And I'm still the chair of uh, EELS Coalition, East Arlington Livable Streets. Um, thank you, thank you. Um, one of the things that I did professionally, or I have done and actually continue to do professionally is um, all the site planning and permitting for um, hubway stations in Cambridge and in city of Boston. Somerville kind of did their own thing and that's fine. Um, but doing that planning work for hubway, and actually I'll ask a question a follow-up to many of Becca's. Who here is a Hubway user on a somewhat regular basis? At least a handful. Probably not too many because all of you have bikes. Uh, so not a surprise there. But as I got into the Hubway planning and permitting, I was introduced in essence to um, Hubway as a, as a bicycle that I hadn't really been on before. A, a heavier, more upright bike. Um, something that I didn't necessarily ride on a daily basis, but I did on occasion. That sort of helped to change my own personal perception of, of my riding 
um, out on the streets, primarily in an urban environment as opposed to recreationally. Um, and I got the Hubway bug in terms of wanting to replicate that design uh, with my own personal vehicle, uh, personal bicycle vehicle, of course. Um, Hubway, you can't just go out and buy a Hubway bike, so I went to Bicycle Bell, a little plug for Bicycle Bell, which has all the great urban city bikes in Somerville, um, and talked to uh, Carice there, the owner, and said I wanted something relatively close to a Hubway bike. So that's sort of my, my, my key piece of advice, which was really our, as we're introducing ourselves, we have one or two minutes to give sort of key advice to uh, new cyclists and others. Um, and that is your choice of bike and the type of bike that you ride, I feel personally for me, um, can really have an impact on safety uh, in terms of a uh, perhaps heavier, uh, slower, more upright city bike um, can really impact speed um, in, in a good way. Slower speed can be safer. I think we all want motorists to drive slower and that's obviously important for our safety, but for their own safety and safety of pedestrians, etc. I think one thing that gets a little short shrift perhaps in bicycle safety advocacy is speed. And this isn't to imply that any of the fatalities or any crashes ha are due to speed. I, I have no data that, that shows that, but I do know that when I'm riding slower and other people are riding just a little slower, I'm not saying five miles an hour, but going a little slower on a more upright bike, you're certainly increasing your opportunity to slow down and stop in front of a door instead of getting door, to um, stop and pull over to the curb rather than getting a right hook or a left hook, to avoid potholes, broken glass. So I think something that we should all think about is um, speed, uh, not necessarily going uh, as fast as possible, just like we don't want motorists going as fast as possible. Uh, and I think that can really help our own personal safety and of all bicyclists uh, regionally. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name's uh, Alex Gordon and I live in Dorchester, Mattapan area. And I haven't been biking as long as a lot of you. I'm gonna say I kinda just started right out riding in the street, which probably wasn't the smartest thing, but it helped me learn and adapt, you know, and learn my limits and whatnot and helped me experience uh, what it's like to cycle in the city. And it can be scary, it can be, you know, pleasurable sometimes and, you know, I can see new things, but, you know, me coming from Mattapan, it's, you know, every neighborhood's different, traffic patterns, whatnot. And what I've learned over the years, you know, biking in my community and working with people who've never biked before, people who stopped biking when they were kids and, you know, now they're 40 years old and, you know, they're like, oh, well, I haven't ridden my bike in 25 years, I want to ride. And, you know, you just work with them and you work with helping them get back to their comfortable level. So. That's what I do in the neighborhood of Mattapan and Dorchester. And with that said, you know, some advice I want to give to, you know, new cyclists or a cyclist that want to get back on their bike is knowing your limits. So if you don't feel comfortable, you know, just hopping out in that bike lane, don't hop out in that bike lane. Because it, it can be a very scary place to be, especially when there's a last minute door to open up and you have cars on your left or cars on your right. You just, it's scary. So just knowing your limits, knowing, you know, where you want to go, what roads to take, you know, really think about it before you just hop on out there because it, it, it gets dangerous. But at some point you will be able to do it. You'll get comfortable doing it and you'll start enjoying doing it like I do. And yeah, that's, that's it. I haven't been biking too long, so I don't have much to say. I've only been biking for about three years. So I uh, yeah, still got a lot to learn from all of you. Good evening. My name is Laura Smeaton. I live in Roslindale. And I, um, in addition just to be riding my bike and being a bike advocate, um, I'm also a League of American Bicyclists LCI, which is a league cycling instructor. Um, I think uh, a lot of people, when they go to evaluate an area for its bikeability, um, and Richard, don't quote me on this, but there's the five E's, right? And I can never remember what they all are, but I just think a, a, a number of them. One is engineering, and that's what the is infrastructure, okay? Do we have bike lanes, things like that? I don't have control over infrastructure engineering. I wish I did. We all wish we did, right? We can advocate for it, but we can't control it. It's there, we have to deal with it. Um, enforcement, I can't control that either. 
Um, evaluation, I don't control that either. I work in infectious diseases and medical research, and so biking is not my profession. I wish it were. Um, but where I feel like um, education and is, I think the missing E is empowerment. And to me, going out and riding my bike is an act of advocacy every single day. And the choices I make in how I ride and learning this incredible toolbox, which we're gonna learn from all the panelists and all from all of you tonight, you're gonna, there's a huge toolbox available to you of different techniques and tricks and choices of ways that you can empower yourself to have a safe ride and a safe ride is a fun ride. And so the one tip of advice that I would give everybody, new rider, and I give it to myself every day because it's a really powerful one is, give yourself an extra five or 10 minutes. Leave an extra five or 10 minutes early. And there are a couple of reasons why to do this. Some of these might be obvious. One is, is that your biggest, in your toolbox, your secret weapon is awareness. If you are not aware of a potentially dangerous situation or a hazard, either a moving hazard or a fixed hazard. If you're not aware of that, you can't react to it and protect yourself and make yourself safe. So you need to be aware. And one of the ways to be aware is to have the time and the space. Excuse me, the time and the space. If you've left yourself some extra time and you're not thinking, oh gosh, I'm running late, I'm running late, I've got to, I'm gonna be late to my meeting or late to meet my friends. If you're stepping back, you're gonna have that freedom and that space to give yourself that awareness to see, oh, there's a taxi parking the bike lane. Let me, um, let me move out because I, I can't be in the bike lane right now. Um, so that's maybe the obvious reason. The unobvious reason, even though I came to biking quite late, I was in my late 30s when I became an urban rider. Um, I'm, so I'm not a very risk-taking person, but I find myself, if I'm running late and I'm thinking about meeting someone, if I come up to an intersection, I may be more likely to push a situation, push a light. Um, if someone wants to, you know, I might try to just push the situation. If I have an extra five or 10 minutes, if somebody wants to go in front of me, let them go in front. It really, um, it loosens that idea of it in an intersection or with a tight situation, you're more likely to back off if you have that extra time. And when you arrive early, treat yourself to an ice cream or cappuccino. <laughs> or you can just be early and, and, or you know, enjoy yourself during the ride. And trust me, when you have that extra time, you really can enjoy the ride. So, look forward to more talks. Should I take this one? Hi, I'm Erin Euler, and I live in Cambridge. Um, I started biking because actually my vision is poor, and I legally couldn't get a driver's license. Um, and actually started biking in much more rural areas than Boston. And one of the reasons why I moved here is because compared to other places, especially generally rural America, there's more infrastructure here. Um, and, and now I've been biking in the city for 12 to 15 years, 12 years. Um, and if I have to give one piece of advice, it is a general technique that I use, which is to communicate endlessly to everyone on the road. Cyclists, motorists, pedestrians, dogs. <laughs> buses. Um, you can't really communicate with cats. <laughs> and I, I just want to let everyone know there's going to be a whole section on communication, so we'll hear all of Aaron's techniques. And a whole subsection on communication with cats. You had the best, the last, the best last words, actually. Um, I'm Laura Borelli. I've, uh, I learned how to bicycle when I was a young child, uh, but I was biking on suburban streets where there were no cars, so bicycling was only fun. Um, I've been bicycle commuting uh, for about 10 years, and my first real bike commuter route to a job I had was uh, from Central Square to Boston Medical Center down Mass Ave. So it was a pretty stressful introduction to bicycle commuting. Uh, these days, I pretty much bike in the Cambridge Somerville area most of the time. Uh, and I 
work at Cambridge Ringe and Latin High School. I teach biology there, but this past school year, I started a bicycle advocacy group for students. So we have about eight really dedicated students at the high school who are really working hard for bike advocacy um, among the high school population. And my advice for all cyclists is to stay out of the door zone. Yeah, that's my advice. We'll probably talk more on that topic throughout the panel today. Great. Thank you all very much. Um, great. So first question, uh, what is Doring, since you uh, brought us there, Laura? And how, what are your tips to avoid it? And so the first person, if you could define it, and then however many of you uh, have tips, please share them. We'll start that conversation because I think about Doring a lot. Um, as a cyclist, the only two accidents I've ever, sorry, the only two crashes I've ever been in have actually been, um, have been Dorings. And uh, in my opinion, a Doring is when a car door obstructs your path and causes you to get into a crash. Um, but that shouldn't be confused with what is actually illegal. Cars aren't allowed to open their car doors in your path, whether or not it results in a bicycle crash. Um, am I correct on that, I believe? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and to avoid dooring, I, I, that's a tricky discussion. I mean, uh, staying out of the door zone, obviously, is really important, but sometimes that means you're in heavy traffic. Uh, sometimes that means you're not in the delineated bicycle lane. And I think that this is a, a source of confusion for a lot of new cyclists because the bike lane is oftentimes in the door zone. So someone parks their car and swings their door open and it completely blocks the entire bike lane. So um, yeah, just to kind of get the discussion started on this. Anyone want to add to this? Um, one thing I wanted to add on that one is I think there's a context, a, a um, sort of uh, parked car context in which, um, and a topographical context uh, that I think is important as part of the Doring discussion. I think um, as we, as, as, as people who are bicycling uh, are riding on flat ground or certainly going down a hill, I think people need to be far more cognizant of Doring. I think the, um, you know, the incident of a door flying open in front of you, whether you're in a bike lane or whether you're not in a bike lane can clearly be catastrophic. Um, if you have the high speeds, so I'm sort of tying back to my earlier discussion about speeds. Um, so that's something that as I'm riding and I'm knowing that my speed, as soon as I'm up, you know, past 10, 12 miles an hour, because I'm on flat ground, I'm going downhill, I start drifting, shying a little bit uh, further away from cars to avoid the, the door zone. I think that's critical. Um, but going up a hill, even if it's a, you know, pretty minor grade or certainly a steeper grade, I personally, you know, maybe not everyone would agree, but I personally will ride in the door zone if, if it's a busier street and it doesn't feel like there's um, uh, uh, a busier street where being out uh, into the lane is not uh, very comfortable. You know, riding in a door zone when I'm going up a little bit of a hill where I might be in the eight to 10 mile an hour zone uh, or um, uh, speed, you know, my ability to stop when a door flies open, even really at the last second, is, is um, it's pretty easily done for me personally. So I think that's just something that people should really pay attention to. If you're going at a certain speed, especially downhill, just make sure you're three or four feet away from the adjacent car. But if you're going uphill, maybe you can relax a little bit. If you're riding in the door zone a little bit, um, it's probably not the end of the world. That's, that's my personal opinion. I wanted to add, um, a lot of the scenarios we're talking about is a bike lane where a car is parked and you're thinking about driver's side doors opening. Um, you also want to think about being doored on the right. Um, I actually was doored on the right. So here's a very common scenario in the Boston area um, where you have a line of traffic all stopped and you've got a small area to the right. And it is legal for bikes to pass on the right, unlike cars. However, be very careful doing that. So let's say you see Everybody stopped, there's a red light, and you're thinking, hey, I'm just gonna cruise right up to the start of that intersection. You're allowed to do that, but I would say do it very, very carefully. Um, think about someone, the case where I was, 
somebody five or six cars back was in a taxi cab and decided, hey, I'm going to pay my fare and get out. And I came up, and the door swung open, and there I was. Um, luckily, I was going slowly, as Phil said, and so it was more of a everyone being scared and an oops rather than something more serious. But I would say be very, very cautious. Anytime you're passing stopped cars on the right, especially approaching intersections. It could be a door opening. It could also be p pedestrians crossing, not at a crosswalk. They see stopped cars and they think, hey, I can, and they don't see you coming, especially if they're large trucks. So again, you can pass on the right and I would just say do it very cautiously and, and don't fly up to that intersection. You can just cruise right up and do that. Yeah. And, and just to Laura's point too, I've endured from the left twice and both times in a bike lane. So it's not even just passing on the right, it's being in your bike lane and a passenger deciding they're ready to get out and not looking. And it's actually legally, for all of you to know and be prepared, the driver's responsibility legally to not allow their passenger to open a car door in your path. Um, but other things to look out for? Uh, I learned how to ride in Tampa, Florida which is really a crappy place. And, uh, and, and there's no infrastructure. So some of the things is that I think Phil spot on. I think as you get into a denser environment, slowness can be your friend. But if you're going to be out, the more you get into the suburban and rural environment, speed can actually, the net differential can change. There's an equilibrium of that door zone to where when you are, when your net differential is zero, meaning you're going as fast as the cars, you might as well be out in their lane and be as, so move away from that door. The other thing is body language and car language. If you, see a, if you see a human being in a car, they're not there long. So really look, there's an awareness. So take the headphones out, like you gotta be all hands on deck when you ride a bike. And it's actually, a, it's a liberating thing. But I just, um, and little things I've learned in urban cycling is when you are, when traffic comes to a stop, Sure, you can advance, but you should not be accelerating. You should just be coasting, and it is like come up off the saddle, get as high as you can get. And A, so you can be seen, and B, so you can see. So it's like bring the periscope up, come up off the saddle, and look when you're going through that line of traffic, and you'll get so much more vision, and they'll be able to see you. And um, I think from an infrastructure point of view, we need to start talking about you know, uh, less parking and more loading zones, more Uber zones, more um, kiss and ride zones for people to drop off, because that's a big problem. So that's enough. Um, we had one question from the audience and defining how wide the door zone is. You know, what defines a door zone? So a door zone, obviously, is going to be different for a car versus a truck. Um, I saw a cyclist who was going very fast down Beacon Street near um, Whole Foods. <clears throat> and he was blazing, and he was in the outside part of the, of the bike lane, but he got slammed by a truck door opening that took up the entire bike lane. So you can't assume the door zone is a uniform distance. So that's a key thing. One, one more piece of advice that, that I use every day. I have a, a mirror on my helmet, and I know what's behind me. If there are no cars behind me, I am in the lane, and I'm confident I'm in the lane, and when I see a car coming, I'll, I'll go into the bike lane. So even if there is a bike lane, there's nobody behind me, I'm in the bike lane. So you can always do that as well. And one point of clarification for all of us, there's been uh, newspaper articles about Amanda Phillips that she ran into an open door. Defend Amanda Phillips. Nobody runs into an open door. She was doored, and that was a criminal act. So. If you hear that, and I've heard it from a number of my friends who are motorists, they said, what was with the cyclist who ran into the open door? It's bullshit. So defend Amanda and um, make sure that that communication is, is, is had that way. Great. Thank you so much, Kent. Well, I was just going to add and agree with you, agree with you Ken, that um, I ride really close to the lane. Um, especially in the morning hours when there are a lot of parked cars and there's a lot of loading and unloading. Um, I often go into um, Boston from Cambridge up Cambridge Street and um, there's like trucks and a lot of businesses on the right side so I really get in the road and with regard to like communication I even like <laughs> I don't know if it's just psychological but I like puff myself out a little bit try to be as big as I can be in the road and um, 
if I get scared, I will ring my bike, or ring my bike, ring my bell endlessly, um, or yell. When I, before I had, at one point I would, um, like, when I was living in Charleston, South Carolina, there was a lot, of, it was like a little bit more rural, and um, if it was really hard to see, I would like play really loud music or um, sing. Loud music is not always the best because you need to be able to hear things going on in the road, but um, those are just some other tips. Awesome. Um, and we're gonna move on to the next question. A couple of other visual cues I wanted to add. Look in side view mirrors, look in windows as you're approaching cars, look for blinkers, look for brake lights. Cars often will stop and swing open that door. And so, again, just as many things that you're aware of that could mean someone is stopping and could be opening their door, the better. Um, Exactly. Thank you, Bruce. Um, great. Thank you so much for all the contributions. Okay. Next types of crashes. Uh, what are what is a right hook? What is a left hook? And how do you anticipate both? What are some more again more of the cues and things that you do to protect yourself? Um, one thing that I do as <clears throat> as I approach intersections. Um, and I'm close to a car, I'm potentially in their blind spot. I know we all are taught to avoid the blind spots of motorists, but I think the reality is in congested urban environments, sometimes you're in that blind spot. Um, what I've learned is that you'll see the tire turning before the car actually turns, just sort of a split second. I mean, obviously they're turning at the same time, but in, I don't know, for me personally, um, as I'm approaching an intersection or a, maybe a busy commercial driveway, uh, I got my head down looking at that, you know, um, passenger side right wheel um, in terms of avoiding a right hook. And as soon as I see that... Can you tell us what a right hook is? Uh, okay, I will in just a sec. So uh, as soon as I see that turning just slightly, I tend to see that before I notice the whole vehicle starting to uh, take a turn. So that's when I either slow down, pull over the curb, go to the left of the, the, the motorist who's taking a right, whatever I need to do. Um, a, a right hook, so what I'm trying to avoid there in that situation <laughs> is a right hook and there's a right hook and a left hook and then just um, keeping it simple, it's just simply when a car is taking a turn, uh, either a right turn in front of a bicyclist path, i.e. a right hook or a left hook um, in front of a bicyclist path going clearly in the opposite direction. Um, the left hook uh, especially can be um, a, a deadly crash type simply because of the speed differential of uh, two vehicles going in different directions. Right hook can certainly be problematic as well, especially um, if there are larger vehicles, trucks, or buses involved. And we know there's, I think, been at least two or perhaps a couple more uh, truck-related right hook fatalities um, in greater Boston in the last couple of years. So that's just my little tip for new cyclists um, uh, uh, in terms of right hooks is uh, keep your eye on that uh, front tire on the right-hand side. Um, the other thing I wanted to add, and I know um, some people will probably disagree with this, and I think that's okay. I think diversity of opinions here is good. Um, pedestrian crossing signals are your friends. Um, as, as bicyclists, <clears throat> when, you're, when I'm at a busy intersection, again, people may disagree whether there's a policy um, change that's required. I don't know, I'll hold back on that. Uh, but at busy intersections, um, when I'm there and there's a pedestrian crossing signal, uh, my own personal safety is my highest priority. Uh, the second, very close behind, is, is courtesy and the safety of pedestrians. Um, I think when that signal goes on and there are pedestrians around, I think it's important to um, get off the bike and walk across uh, or perhaps ride very, very slowly. Um, but if there are no other pedestrians around, and I know that for a fact, for my, again, for my personal safety, busy intersections, I ride through. Again, I do it slowly. I know it's against the law. I know that in Somerville, especially in Union Square and a few other spots, uh, the police will be out and they'll give you a warning and ultimately a ticket. Um, and I think that's something we need to be cognizant of. Again, um, safety and courtesy to other pedestrians is key. 
Uh, so I do recommend certainly walking on most occasions, but I think by doing that and by taking advantage of what's called a LPI, a lead pedestrian interval, which is that little three second um, uh, time period when the, cr uh, the pedestrian crossing light goes on before the light goes green. If you're a cyclist and there isn't a uh, pedestrian in front of you, I say go. I know technically that is not legal, but that is absolutely for the safety of cyclists to give you a three second head start out into that intersection um, that helps to avoid a, a right hook and depending on the intersection, a left hook too. So I think that's something we should all think about, but again, courtesy, courtesy, courtesy. I don't want anyone to misinterpret what I'm saying. Um, anyway, and, and again, I know, uh, I'd love to hear some feedback on that because maybe not everyone on the panel agrees. Well, um, kind of similar to what Phil just said, uh, it's important to go into cycling knowing that uh, the roads weren't really designed for bicyclists. That doesn't mean you should just break every rule and every law, uh, but it does mean you should use common sense. So in the case of the left hook, you're at a big intersection and the car in front of you sees that you're a cyclist, they're going to try to sneak their left hand turn in as soon as the light turns green. And that's actually not the way the road rules work. We all learn in driver's ed that the right, people with the right of way are the ones going straight. So when it comes to a left hook situation, I typically am a more aggressive cyclist um, and I will, even when my light is still red, I basically let that person know, I'm not gonna let you take that left turn. I'm going to go straight. And in that case, I might anticipate my green light by a few seconds because then it, sends a clear message to them, no, I'm not gonna let you break the law just because I'm slower than you. Um, I take a very different approach with the right hook situation in that I see a lot of cyclists sort of, I, I mean, I don't wanna say this, but it seems as though a lot of cyclists are sort of righteously not being cautious of the fact that any car to your left could be taking a right-hand turn without signaling to you whatsoever. And I saw it happen as early as a few hours ago. It happens literally every single time I go out and bike. Just like I assume every car door is going to open in my path, I assume that every car to my left is about to take a right-hand turn. And that, I feel like, keeps me pretty safe considering the amount of time I spend cycling. Uh, one thing I wanted to add was what I do personally is I will take the lane and I'll take the whole lane and I'll let the car make the right. Uh, coming here today, I counted 11 cars cut in front of me and the only reason I knew they were going to is because I can hear them step on the gas, pull in front, break with giving me probably about only six feet to stop before they cut me off. And I'm all right because I was going slow. I didn't have my road bike, but if I had my road bike, I probably would have been going a lot faster and I probably wouldn't have seen them do that, but when I come up to an intersection, I always assume they're gonna make their right. And I count people, you know, when they make their right, and I notice majority of people don't use their turn signal. You'll just get a yank of the wheel last minute, and it's scary, but what I wanna say is I'll always take the lane, and that's probably, in my opinion, the best thing to do, because cars can see you, I'm right in the middle, if you try and pass me on either end, you're clearly gonna either crash or hit someone else or something. So it just would probably be the safest instead of letting them go. Just take the lane, take your time, make sure everyone can see you and get through that intersection as safe as possible. Yeah. So to add to this discussion, I think there's sort of a natural order of things when we think about approaching intersections. And that would be that the rightmost traffic is turning right, and if you're going straight, you shouldn't be in the rightmost traffic. And so I feel like lane positioning is a great way to communicate your intentions, in addition to hand communications. But you think, well, how do I indicate I'm going straight? Because the problem is when you're on the far right, a lot of people don't signal right, but people are gonna assume that you're turning right because you're at the very right edge. So the way I approach this is, is if I'm not turning right at the intersection, I make sure I'm not at the right most and that I don't have cars to the left at me that can do a right hook. So for example, coming over the Mass Ave Bridge today, coming from Boston into Cambridge, there's a bike lane and a lot of cars turning left. I looked behind, there was space. 
I took myself out of the bike lane and physically put myself in that rightmost lane so the car behind me could not right hook me. If they could, they would have to have done it from the left hand lane. Okay, so I think by physically communicating that can be a really good way. And for the left hook situation, again, if I'm going straight through an inter intersection, I will actually signal straight yeah. to that car going ahead. So I'll signal this way. If that driver doesn't get it, I'm gonna back down because I'm not gonna win a contest. But a lot of times I'll get a, and I give them a big thumbs up. Okay, so again, you can signal going straight to try to help counteract that left turn signal. But I would just say, again, even if the infrastructure puts you in the wrong position, so for example, coming across the BU Bridge into Boston, there's a counterflow bike lane where the cars must turn right onto Amory Street, but you're signaled to go straight, yet the bike lane puts you to the right of the right turning traffic, get out of the bike lane. Don't make the infrastructure put you in a place of danger in that coffin corner. Get out of the coffin corner. If you're going straight, put yourself where the cars are going straight. I like that positive reinforcement, that thumbs up. You know, it's, it's good to let people know that they've done something right and that we're thankful. Um, the comments are great. Uh, all of them are great. Uh, I come from a racing background. I very often coach a lot of beginner racers. I'm like, how'd your race go? Oh, I crashed. And they're like, well, what happened? And he tells me the story. He goes, there was nowhere for me to go. I had to go into the crash. It's like, well, why were you there? Why did you put yourself in a place where there was only one option? Always have an A and a B. If you don't have a B route, what are you there for? And like the, the whole right hook thing is as I approach any intersection, I'm like, I, I start to open the B door all the time. And that's what Laura's talking about. It's like, don't go in there if you don't know exactly what's going on. So always have, a, always have a B route. Now I'm gonna throw it back to you guys. The last time I got hurt on a bike was what's called a courtesy crash. Who can tell me what a courtesy crash is? It's a version of the left hook that's very, very alarming. Anybody? Because I just learned this. All right, you're coming up the right lane and you're going to work and everything's cool and the cars are jacked up in traffic and then a driver says, waves another driver through. And in the world of cars, they're thinking there's only cars in this world. And you're coming up, you are the blade of the guillotine coming up. And that's the last time I actually got hurt on a bicycle was a courtesy crash. She was crying, I was fine, but I went, you know, it was, but a courtesy crash is one thing to really, you gotta look for. When the cars stack up in traffic, they're gonna allow a motorist to make a left across two lanes. So that's when again, up periscope. And don't, when you see a gap open in the traffic, extra, extra caution. So I, I got called on using terminology that was, okay. Um, I used a term which needs to be defined, so thank you for that question. And I used a term called a coffin corner. It's a really, it's a kind of strong language, but I think it's, it makes me, remi it reminds me how serious this is. And let me sh uh, show an example. Um, I was coming up, um, it was actually Mass Ave, um, coming up to an intersection and I saw um, a big truck and I thought, oh gosh, I don't want to be in the blind spot of that truck because that truck won't see me and could make a right turn. I thought, but you know what? I can get ahead of that truck and so I'll be out of his blind spot and then we'll be and won't be in that, that right hook corner at an intersection in that blind spot. And with trucks, if you think about the blind spot, it's, re it's in relation to the size of the vehicle. So you, most of us don't drive huge trucks or buses. I don't have a commercial license. So I kind of know what a blind spot is in a car, but you have to like double it or triple it. So it's, it's related to the size of the vehicle. But here I thought, okay, well, I'm gonna inch my way up. And as soon as I started to inch my way up, there was another truck that I couldn't see. And I thought, oh no. And here the light was red. That truck decided to make a ride on red. And where was I? I actually had to jump off my bike and throw myself against the car not to be literally crushed by this bike. So the coffin corner is where you're stopped to the right of a very large vehicle in that blind spot. They could, and they, you can't, they can't see you. And that's a right hook situation, even at slow speed, which can be very dangerous. Uh, very quickly, and then I know you wanna move on, Becca. I've been pretty silent because I mostly don't bike, um, but I grew up in a truck driving family and spent the first 16 years of my life in 18 wheelers. And I can tell all of you, um, that, that the experienced drivers are typically extremely safe, but they get zero training on any vehicles other than cars. And um, their sight lines, they cannot see you, period.
period. If you're on the right, if you're on the left, if you think I am five cars behind, I am going really slow, they cannot see you. When you are in a truck, you, I mean, I'm talking like 50 yards. It is, and, and I think one other thing to, to pay attention to, if a truck is coming to an intersection and giving you space or moving to the left, it's not because they see you and they're giving you space, it's because they're planning on taking a right turn. Um, and they need the space to take the right turn. So assume that they can't see you unless you've made eye contact, and if they're giving you space, assume they are turning. Thanks, Stacey. And that goes back to... You know, infrastructure and engineering and education, we need those drivers to be educated. We need trucks to change uh, the way they're set up so that they don't have those blind spots, et cetera. Um, the very last question, we're going to ask about crashes. Uh, and we just, we'll just hear from one of you, so you can fight over it, is what do you do when you approach train tracks and what's the hazard that they pose to people who are biking? <laughs> So approaching train tracks can be different, uh, difficult, and you know it's not like coming up to a normal intersection because there's, especially in the Boston area, if you come up to a lot of the railroad crossings, you'll notice that there'll be signs saying the train does not honk its horn. So the risk I face is if I do not look, there's gonna be a speeding train coming if the gates aren't working. So. I have to stop, I have to dismount from my bike, look. I mean, I'm not saying I do that every time, I'm gonna be real honest. Sometimes I just blow right through, but on the days I'm going slower, I have to stop and look both ways. And the struggles I have is being on a road bike, I'll have very thin tires, railroad tracks have a very big gap, and basically, if you don't cross the tracks at the right angle, it will grab your tire and it'll throw you down. End of story. You just it's very hard to recover when tracks grab your wheel. You can't steer out of it. It's just one of those, it grabs you, it throws you down. Uh, a crossing, for example, by the BU Bridge, crossing those trolley tracks is a very busy intersection and there are holes, yeah. just straight up holes from the winter when the snow plows come by and they are the size of my bike helmet. So they can, they can swallow whole tires and Metal, as you know, can be sharp. So there's just more than, it's not, I'm not a car with four wheels. I can't just bump over it with shocks and suspension and whatnot. It's, I have a bike, it's a road bike, very narrow tires. I feel every little bump. The dangers are the holes, the sharp twisted metal. I can slash my tire. And then on top of all that, not only do I have to look down, but I have to look to my left, I have to look to my right and it just, it's, it's, it can be an overwhelming situation. So I hope I explained that right to everyone. There's a lot more to look at than just driving. Yeah, and, and just a couple other things, you know, train tracks are the worst because usually they're not just crossing the street at a perpendicular angle. Usually they're at about a 45 degree angle. So in order to hit your perpendicular angle, you've gotta go into the lane to then go back and get your 90 degree angle that you wanna cross at. So again, it's, you know, knowing that you're gonna have to look for cars in the lane and all the other situa situational awareness that you need. And additionally, tracks are slippery when wet. So, cautious, words of caution. Ken, please bring us through defensive cycling techniques. Okay, and I will mention <clears throat> one more thing that can protect you from the coffin corner, or I saw on a website today the red light of death, which I thought was a really interesting and slightly exaggerated, but, but it could be. So what we're doing in Somerville is we're putting in bike boxes. So you'll see these little green boxes that are basically right behind the, right ahead of the stop line for cars, and bike lanes feed into the, the bike boxes. When you're stopped at a red light, if there's a bike box, get in it. Even if you're making a right turn, get in the bike box. That makes you very visible. It puts you out ahead of traffic. What we'd love to have are right, or basically bicycle signal signals in the traffic lights as well would give you a head start. But until we get those in place, if you see a bike box, take it. If you think an intersection needs a bike box, clamor for it, advocate for it. So let's, let's hold questions for now, but we want to move into the next section, which we've really covered a lot of this already, so we'll probably move through this pretty quickly. Um, defensive uh, cycling techniques. Uh, Richard already brought up complete awareness. Even though he's drinking a beer right now, he still has complete awareness. Um, and he will be fine by the time he gets on his bike. 
Um, which also, while we're on the topic, let me bring this up. We are having, a, a, and this is defensive driving, so it kind of fits in. We are in a bar. We are enjoying beer. We're talking about bikes. Many of us biked here. You are going to bike home. Please, everybody, really drink responsibly when you're, when you're biking. It doesn't take a lot of beer in you to really impair your judgment. So if you are drinking a lot, call an Uber. Leave your, lock your bike up. But just really, bikes and beer mix a little bit. Bikes and a lot of beer do not mix well. So, okay, defensive cycling techniques. So, um, we talked about when you take the lane, and I think we had a good conversation about taking the lane. Panelists? Okay. Um, so, who would like to take that question? What does it mean to take the lane? Uh, I'll take this. Um, I like to use the term control the lane, but same thing, same thing. The idea is, is that um, you're traveling, in a traffic lane. Um, sometimes uh, that's actually suggested by a Shero, which would be a bike emblem with chevrons above that. You might see that right in the middle of a lane. And it basically says, here's a lane where there's not enough room for a side-by-side -side lane and then travel lane. So it's telling you, and usually that's a suggested location. So I see them on Huntington Avenue in Boston, and it's saying ride right in the middle of this lane. Now, if I'm maneuvering out um, from a bike lane, say, say there's a a UPS truck parked in the bike lane and I need to then take the lane because I need I can't run into the back of the UPS truck I'll see it way ahead I'll start looking back looking back when can I merge into traffic see when there's a place to do it signal and then maneuver move over to the left and then basically merge into traffic and then beyond and then merge back off so you know a lot of times I'm only taking the lane for a short period of time to maneuver around a pothole, to move around glass, to maneuver around sand, a parked car, something like that. It may not be for a long period, but again, it's just an option that you use as needed um, to be safe. Erin? Oh. Um, I want to add that when, when I'm doing that, I follow those steps, and then if, if I can, if when I look back, I can actually see, I'll try hard to make eye contact if there's a car coming or like really look at them. And I think when looking back, they see your face and I think that helps. Um, another thing is if, if I see I might need to take the lane, but it's a little bit ahead and I'm nervous and not feeling like I can look too much. Um, I do this thing that's kind of weird where um, I like go back, I go like this where I'm like trying to, oh, sorry. I'm trying to signal to the person behind me I, like, I need this space. And so I just kind of like, I don't know if anyone else says that, but it makes me, you do it? It makes me feel like I'm articulating that I need that. And because sometimes it's, you don't feel comfortable to actually turn around. Um, one thing that new cyclists do when they are maybe thinking about taking the lane, uh, when new cyclists look to their left, they tend to have the bike go to the left which can be very dangerous. So if you're a new cyclist and you're looking left, make sure you're not tracking your handlebars to the left. You want to keep your handlebars straight and look this way. Again, put a mirror on your helmet, put a mirror on your handlebars. Don't trust the mirror 100%. You do have to double check and look. But the more you can keep yourself going forward without twisting your body, obviously you're not going to make any sudden movements into traffic. Um, add on a good way to learn how to do that is the way we talk about that is I think a problematic people say look over your shoulder and when you look over okay so the secret to do this is you, you almost look under think about dropping your chin to your shoulder and you're actually looking down some people some uh, racers they actually look under their armpits but that's because they're a little more aerodynamically so if you're more upright just literally think of dropping your chin to your shoulder and you're less likely to actually move into traffic and I would encourage people practice looking back all the time and do it when you're when nobody's around so that you feel really comfortable continuing moving forward and test yourself and use that left edge of the bike lane to test yourself of how straight you're going or do it in a parking an em empty parking lot Okay, it's a fun thing to do with kids. Uh, one yeah. thing I wanted to add is I, I think it's important to acknowledge, especially for new cyclists or those even more experienced who are riding with children perhaps or with older people, taking a lane is really difficult for a lot of people. I think that 
needs to be acknowledged, I think, for a lot of the more experienced people like us here up on, in the panel and elsewhere. We sort of, it's, it's a given that taking a lane is, is very important and it's a very safe technique and, and I agree that it is, but I've been cycling basically my whole life ever since I was a kid and I've been a urban bike commuter in cities as varied as New York and New York was no picnic back in the early 90s, I can tell you that, uh, and Portland, Oregon uh, and elsewhere and I've been doing that much urban riding and I still generally don't feel that comfortable taking a lane. I find that being out in the lane, I do it because I know it's important and I know there are certain circumstances where by far it's the best thing to do. But what just frustrates me to no end is when I'm in the lane, even if I'm in the middle of the lane or a little bit to the left, closer to the double yellow if there is one, cars almost always, unless there's traffic on the other side, unless it's a congested roadway, always will go around me, almost without exception. I think the most frustrating experience is just about every day on Webster Street, coming out of Union Square, going to Cambridge Street. It's really narrow. I always take the lane there, and inevitably, two, three, four cars um, will pass me. They'll wait till there's a gap, of course, for those going in the other direction. But anyway, so I, maybe I'm just throwing this out there. I have no specific advice, but I just think that it's important to acknowledge that. So, so there's a question um, that was whispered to me from an audience member. Um, what does it mean to take the lane? Where should you be? Do you, if you've got a whole lane to take, where should you be? So um, Alex and then Laura. So when I take the lane, I will signal and I personally take the whole lane. As in I'll go right in the middle. I do not care about drivers. I'm taking the lane, you're just gonna have to wait. That's it, no ifs, ands, or buts. You wanna pass me, take the other lane, you have the other lane. Generally, I'll take the lane when it's one lane of traffic or there's a bike lane because, you know, as a lot of, you know, drivers do, they double park in the bike lane. So I, I'm kind of, I have no choice. I, I'm not a ghost. I can't just go through a car. So I go straight in the middle of the lane after I signal and I hold my ground until I'm able to go back into the bike lane. And the, the reason Alex does that is because there's no such thing as kind of taking a lane. That's actually incredibly Perfect. dangerous because if you are sort of taking a lane but not really, the, if the car has enough room or thinks they have enough room, which is an illusion a lot of the times, they will try to pass by you. And in doing so, they might push you back over to the door zone. So if you feel uncomfortable like you are in the door zone and you can't be in the door zone, and the only way to be out, out of the door zone is to be in the traffic, then you have to 100% fully take the lane. Um, I think there's a huge range of how long people feel comfortable taking the lane. I personally don't like to take the lane for an extended period of time because I can like sense the cars behind me and it makes me actually uncomfortable, but there are certain roads where I just know I have to take the lane, like Beacon Street, in Boston, I feel like you just kind of have, I mean, there's three lanes there. So just like take the rightmost yeah, yeah. lane and just like you're taking it, you know? So I think, yeah, thank you. Um, I think uh, language is really important. And we've talked, to, the term here is defensive cycling. I think <coughs> confident cycling is really important. When you take a lane, I think maybe take it or control is a good word because how you present yourself, and I mean how you physically, people are talking about acting big, you did this, if you kind of are acting very shy and timid in cycling, people will take advantage, okay? Because they'll be like, she doesn't know what she's doing. Let me just pass her. Um, I was in Philadelphia, and this was just a couple of years ago, and here I thought, okay, I'm an LCI, I know what I'm doing. I was cycling in a new city, and all of a sudden, I thought, oh my gosh, these drivers are so aggressive. I thought I was being run over right and left. And what I realized was, I wasn't communicating and being very clear. I, I didn't know where I was going, so I was kind of hugging the ride, and I kind of sort of signaled because I didn't know where I was going, and then I realized the cars were just passing me. And after a few days, when I realized, oh, now I know where I'm going, I thought, there, I need to be there. And all of a sudden, the cars respected me because they knew what I wanted to do, and just my asserting myself in a confident way, there, I had a completely different reaction in a matter of days. So I would encourage you to ride with friends, um, practice routes, practice routes in non-stressful times, try out a new commuting route on the weekend, on a Sunday morning, get really familiar with knowing, oh, if I need to make that left turn, I need to position myself here. Do that in a low stress situation, get really comfortable doing that. 
So when it comes to that commuting time, you really know what you're doing and you're not thinking, gosh, where am I? Um, and again, I think things are really for situational. Um, your toolbox might change. So for example, if I go somewhere and I don't know where I'm going, I teach kids when we're doing safe routes to school, I say, hey, every bicyclist comes with a pedestrian. And I encourage kids to jump off their bike. But guess what? I do that too. If I get to Kenmore Square and I'm like, oh man, I need to be over there. I just jump off my bike, right? It's like, it's what? It's an extra 30 seconds or an extra minute. So if I'm somewhere unfamiliar or it's really crazy, I jump off my bike. And you always have that available to you. And we're gonna talk about some other things like le um, box turns and things like that. But don't think that that's being a wimp or that you're above that. Um, you always have pedestrian right attached to you and that's available to you at any point. Don't be scared to use it. Uh, I want to add one quick um, strategy to build off both Laura's. Um, I think we've all acknowledged that it's stressful when you're taking the lane. It feels uncomfortable and we have different barriers for how long we can stay in the lane. And for me, I've found that um, getting involved with other cyclists at events like this, there's so many other things going on too, like any of the biking events um, or biking social groups. If you can go to more of them and then when you are feeling really anxious, just think of all these people who are next to you who are supporting you. I think a reason why we're all here is because a fellow cyclist had an accident and there's more than just you on the road. So take the lane confidently and you have our support. As an inexperienced biker, I want to add to that. Um, so one thing that I would just add is that if you have experience and you're passing someone, don't put someone maybe wearing a fabulous black romper on a hubway on Mass Ave today in a situation where they're in the do door zone behind a UPS truck and you cut me off. Uh, because what the bike community did to me today three times would put, was put me in very dangerous situations because they were annoyed that I was going so slow and they were trying to get to work. And so I think, I think that we can't blame the bike community because there are just as many drivers and pedestrians who are annoying. But I would say we're all here tonight because lots of people feel unsafe. And I would encourage those who have more experience to help those of us who don't have experience feel okay and feel safe and feel protected on the road too. Just a, off of that, uh, motorists have not cornered the market on assholes, okay? Um, you know, a good rider can ride fast and ride at the front. A great rider can ride at the back. And, you know, you want to let, there's a big concern. One of the things you learn in racing is the person in backs, it's their fault. And when you get somebody anxious and they're looking back, you're putting yourself at risk because they're now looking backwards eyes forward, and I'm always saying, take your time, take your time, wait until they're calm, and then pass them gently, and none of this, on your left, I hate that, just like, I'm gonna come by you on your left, and you're gonna be here, have a gentle tone, just be kinder to an inexperienced rider, they really appreciate it. Or, or just, just say, hello, how are you? Also works as well. And while we're on the topic, don't pass cyclists on the right. It is unexpected, it's dangerous, and just, you know, t t take your time, pass on the left when you can. So, um, okay, so we are, we're approaching nine o'clock. We probably have about 10 more minutes. We're gonna buzz through some quick things. We'll get to your questions, and then at 9.30 we'll break, and then we'll do music and have more conversations. So, the, I think for the last thing on here, we talked about it a little bit. We cannot stress it enough. So I want to ask the panelists, how do you handle trucks and buses and large vehicles? Because we have seen that many of the deaths that we have seen in the cycling community have involved buses and trucks. I know we've covered this a little bit. We can't stress it enough. When do you pass them? When do you not pass them? What do you do when you're at a red light and there's a line of bicyclists and you happen to be next to a truck because you're 12 deep? So maybe. Uh, maybe two panelists can jump on that, and then we'll move on to some other questions. So, let's see. So, for 
anything big like a truck, I let them go first. I would never, so I'll stop way back. Even if that means there's a lot of space ahead of me in the intersection, I wanna let that truck clear the intersection because I don't know what they're gonna do. So I just never put myself in the blind spot. Um, something about buses. Um, we mentioned that bikes can pass vehicles on the right. I will never pass a bus on the right. Buses can stop when you don't expect them outside of bus stops and people might run towards them or leave them in an unexpected way. And so I feel like just don't, I only pass on the left. And if that means just stopping because you're not prepared to pass them on the left, then that's kind of what to do. But I think it's very simple. Just I never put myself in the blind spot, stopped or moving. And if that, in that, you know, that's it. And one thing, one thing to just follow up on that, not to disagree with you on passing a bus on the left, but I've seen too often um, bicyclists who are too eager to pass buses on the left, and they're not necessarily paying attention to their signals. And frequently, buses may start pulling out if they're picking up people. They'll start pulling out just a little before their signal, their left signal goes on. And I've just, I, for some reason, I see this all the time at the 77 bus stop in Porter Square, heading out towards Arlington. It's a busy bus stop next to the Dunkin' Donuts at the shopping plaza. There's always buses over there. There's always picking up a lot of people. And inevitably, cyclists, many of whom come out of Somerville Ave, or they're coming up uh, Mass Ave from Harvard Square, are really eager to get around the bus. And just as it's pulling out, inevitably, there's a cyclist or two that are frequently kind of stuck out in the middle of between the two traffic lanes. Um, simply because they just didn't want to be a little more patient to let the bus pull out of the bus stop first and then just ride uh, behind it. So uh, a lot of my experience commuting through Boston is riding up along Blue Hill Ave and Warren Street and Washington Street. And those are all covered by multiple bus routes and by the extended buses. So that's extra bus I have to deal with. That's not normal bus, that's extra bus. Yeah. And generally when they pass me, they'll come up because they're hybrids. They'll come up and right hook me, leaving, you know, a nice little cubicle of which I can smack into. But what I've learned is I judge, you know, uh, well, first I take the lane always because there's not many bike lanes there. But I take the lane, the bus drivers either wait or they pass me. And when they pass me, I judge at the bus stop, you know, I count how many people are there. If there's 15 people waiting to get on the bus, I know it's gonna take more than five minutes. So that's when I'll make the decision to stop behind the bus, try not to get blasted in the face by the big fans and the exhaust, and I will look over my shoulder, check, no cars are coming, I'll pass on the left, because I know that bus is gonna take forever. If I see no one at the bus stop and the bus is trying to stop, I will not pass. Because I already know they do not look, they don't check, and they don't care, to be straight honest. They just don't care. They pull in, they pull out. Anyone's in their way, you're getting hit. So I don't ever recommend passing. I just recommend waiting. Try not waiting directly behind the bus, because like I said, there's exhaust, there's fans. They whip up a lot of sand and rocks. Just take your time, and that's what I do. And be smart about it. Judge the pedestrians, how many are there and then pass. Or, you know, some bus drivers will wait and hold off and they'll let you go in front. So that's what I've learned. Great, thanks Alex. Um, so we're gonna switch gears and talk uh, a little bit more specifically about a few more communication techniques. We've talked about quite a few. Um, we've talked about, you know, you've got your left signal, your right, or your right. Um, you know, you wanna do those with confidence. Uh, we talked about that I'm going straight. Yeah. Um, we talked about eye contact, which is really important so that you know the driver has seen you. Um, can some of you talk about some of the more maybe subtle or non-subtle uh, visual cues that you use to communicate, either to cyclists or to drivers? For me, when I come up to an intersection and I'm in the coffin zone, I think as you called it, I will stare at you and I will wait till you look at me. I will not break eye contact. I wanna be seen. I will make it as weird as possible. I don't care as long as you look at me and I just look at you and I make eye contact and I make sure you know. 
So that way, if you still make that turn and hit me, I mean, I just, you saw me, so you can't deny it. But that's what I do. I just want to make sure, you know, trucks too, I'll look inside view mirrors. You know, I've been doored about eight times in three years. And yeah, a few of those times I've looked directly at people and they still had the nerve to open the door. So what I do is I just, I'll just stare at you. I don't care. I'll look at you. I'll make faces. I'll make sure you know me, you know, I'll scream, I'll shout, you know, just basically eye contact for the most part actually gets the message through from what I found is just looking at someone and acknowledging that yes, I'm here and yes, I'm coming through and to just hold off, it takes about three seconds for me to pass, so. Um, one thing I do is say I've taken a lane and I know that I've got someone behind me um, if I see where I've got a place where I, a little further, um, I move over back. I give them the wave. Thank you. Again, communicating, saying, yes, I acknowledge I slowed you down. Thanks a lot. Um, I try to wave or blow kisses anytime somebody does something nice. I mean, kisses are free. You can make someone's day. Make a new friend. Um, if, you're, if I'm stopped at a light and I'm making a left, a lot of times I'll signal, and as I signal, I'll look behind me to the car behind me to see are they seeing that I'm signaling? Because maybe it's, especially if it's not a left-only turn lane, a lot of lanes we have, you can do a straight or left, and I might be able to make that left immediately because of oncoming traffic. So I want to know, is this person behind me gunning it? Um, if I see them and they give a nod, again, I get the thumbs up, maybe blow a kiss. Um, or if I see them on their phone, I have that information. That person's not paying attention. I need to think about now, how do I want to maneuver this intersection? Because this person is not paying attention. Um, so just your looking and seeing what other people are doing is information you can use for how do I need to ne negotiate the situation? Do I need to think about plan B um, what, what to, if something starts to go south? Well, while you mentioned, um, so we're going to stop in just like a few minutes. Um, two stage left. <laughs> we haven't talked about the Copenhagen left, the two-stage left. So whoever would like to talk about that, quick comment, maybe uh, Phil or someone you haven't heard from in a little while. Uh, two-stage left, what is it? Um, or Laura. It's my favorite. Oh, I used it on you. the way over here today. Um, it's a great way, to key, the key here is it gives you a wonderful option. If you're not feeling comfortable because it's a crazy, you know, Again, to, to, in the natural order of things, if you need to make a left turn, you should be doing it from the left turn lane. But that left turn lane may be three lanes over, and that may be really scary because of traffic. So that box left gives you a safe, legal option to not have to make that, because you don't want to swing from the right to the left, because that doesn't make sense. So the way you do a box left, is, or two-stage left, is you do it in two stages. You proceed through the intersection as if you were going straight. When you get to the other side, you stop, and if you had a green light, if you maneuver your bike turn 45 degrees, then now you're facing the other direction, now you have a red light, you wait at that red light, and when that light turn, turns green, then you proceed, okay? So you go straight, stop, turn, and then do it the second time. So you're, you're able to stay on the right-hand side of the road, yet make a left-hand turn. What's so nice about that is, is it takes an area where maybe the, there's a no left turn, so for example, Beacon Street to Mass Ave to go over to the Mass Ave Bridge over to Cambridge, and you can make a legal left